Uh, hello. Um, I'm Chris. I work on the virtualization team at Microsoft. Um, I'm here to talk about some of the work we're doing in the confidential space with uh, OpenHCL and our paravisor. Oh, sorry. So real quick, I want to define what we define as a paravisor. So it is a firmware component that runs inside the guest at a higher privilege level. And specifically, it provides emulation for the unenlightened guests. So that's APIC emulation and interrupt virtualization. And it can provide multiple services like a VTPM or device frangulation or legacy emulated devices. You know, it's, it's essentially a full VMM running inside uh, the guest. Um, and, and of course, you know, you're going to ask, well, why do I want a paravisor instead of an SVSM? The answer is you want to run guests that are not fully enlightened. So that's guests like Windows, guests like older Linux distributions. And you want to provide standard device interfaces. So that's like, well, instead of having to do, you know, different attestation protocols or SVSM protocols, you can use the TPM via existing MMIO drivers. Um, I'm going to give a very brief overview of OpenHCL. I have a BOF session later today. That's where I want most of the, you know, I'm happy to answer any technical questions, but I don't want to kind of derail this conversation here since I want to kind of talk about, you know, Paravisor and how it intersects with the rest of the CC community. Uh, but essentially it's a Linux, it's a very minimal Linux kernel with a user mode VMM written in Rust. Uh, we are open sourcing this later this year. This is kind of the architecture of what's running inside the higher privilege level. You know, we have some processes. We have this MSHP VTL driver that manages all the virtualization APIs. Um, kind of if we think about our design philosophy, you know, we want to minimize our kernel changes. We want to do as much in user mode as possible. Um, this means, you know, doing device drivers, doing as much logic in the, in the user mode VMM as possible. You know, we write Rust. We want to write as much safe idiomatic Rust. We don't want to use unsafe except when absolutely necessary. And we want to keep the VMM code OS agnostic so we can run it, you know, in other environments, even outside of the paravisor. Um, you know, we can talk a little bit about the VMM worker from the previous slide. Uh, it's basically just a main a VMM process. We handle exits. We have per VP executor threads for performance. Again, I'm not really going to go too much in detail here because this time section is very limited. The, the questions I really want to pose are, you know, this is kind of a starting point. You know, we are, at Microsoft, we find a lot of value in having a paravisor. You know, could we have a single code base that supports both an SVSM and a paravisor, right, with Coconut? Um, could we run the open VMM user mode in Coconut? You know, how, do TDIS, how are TDIS devices going to work? So kind of just opening the floor for questions and discussion. Um, so I actually see, see a lot of value of, of running your Rust user space on, on Coconut SVSM. Mm -hmm. And I'm really keen to learn from the code you're open sourcing what is actually needed in Coconut SVSM to make that work. Right. Because right now it's, of course, not there yet. So Coconut is not there yet to run it. Right. Um, but I'm very keen to learn what's needed to run it there as well. Yeah. And, and you know, I'm... To touch on it really briefly, like we chose, there are multiple avenues you could go to implement a paravisor in Rust, right? You can imagine we could have gone down the coconut SVSM path where we write no standard Rust, but we found writing no standard Rust is very hard, right? It's very hard to accomplish certain things. It's very hard to be effective, right? So we look to utilize the Linux kernel to provide a standard Rust interface so that we can write standard Rust code, use standard crates if we want to, you know, have a lot more flexibility and use other tools of Rust to get us the performance that we need. Right, yeah, so one thing we definitely need for that is to have a, a standard Rust target for, for right. the Coconut user space, so right. that's probably one of the most important things to have. Exactly. Right, so. So one question. I think this open H HCL thing provides a uh, VTPM thing. Yes. We also have just heard about Coconut providing a VTPM thing. Yes. Is there some collision there? Um, and also, I, I think, are there, do you think there's any answers from your implementation of the VTPM that might be useful in some of the questions that we've just been scratching our heads about for the 
coconut-like persistence. I think yours is stateful, but is, I don't know if it's trusted or anyway. We but. support both ephemeral and stateful, but you know we've seen the discussions about stateful TPM can be uh, contentious, maybe, or interesting. You know, I think really the pairvisor cannot make certain guarantees about even when your TPM is stateful. You know, I'm unfortunately my background is not really deep in the attestation space, so I can't unfortunately answer a lot of questions here. But you know, we can we can discuss a little bit more here or in the bot. Like do you want do you want me to talk a little bit more or are there any other things that people wanted to ask? So what type of events do you need to handle? And do we even have all of these events available as part of our VTL1 code? Uh, so in your case, uh, VMPL0? Yeah, so we, we actually support running both in SMP TDX with partitioning or in Hyper-V VSM. Um, but it means for something like Coconut to integrate there, you would need to have some interface that basically right. tells you, we, we hey, would need to tell have me on this MIO trap on this. Exactly. We would need to have Coconut exposed basically kind of like a virtualization interface similar to you know, MSHV or KVM or WHP that allows the user mode VMM to get all the exits it needs to handle emulating whatever the unenlightened guest needs. Okay. At which part you really are completely also, even, even though you're running in that user space or potentially special user space in Coconut, mm -hmm. you would still be part of the full TCB because you effectively have right. full this is part. A pairvisor is part of your full TCB, yes. Because you are trusting, especially your guest is unenlightened, right? The unenlightened guest and the customer, you are trusting the pairvisor to provide security and enlightenment. Well, you don't, don't have to go there. You, can, you, can, you could do a, uh, an in-between where you're, you basically have a fake shared state mm -hmm. between uh, your, your more or less unenlightened guest and your paravisor, where the paravisor only has windows of access. Yeah, you could, you could design it like that, right? Today, these all run within the same address okay. space with you know, VTLs or uh, VMPLs. So if your guest is unenlightened, how does it get to know and learn that it actually runs in a confidential environment at all? It doesn't. So what's the point then? <laughs> that's, that's kind of the point, right? Like you want to run a workload that wouldn't run in a confidential guest. Uh, the answer to that might be to reduce liability for a cloud service provider, just being able to take an existing workload, run it in a confidential VM, and even if the customer didn't ask for it, then they can say, well, we just never saw your data. There are a lot easier ways to achieve the same thing. Uh, so you need uh, guest uh, enlightenments to run confidential compute uh, workloads today, and this is lift and shift. I understand. It's just that if you, if you completely lift and shift without any enlightenment, then you don't know as the guest that you're now actually confidential. I could be lying to you, right? I could put you in an SEV SMP thing with a backdoor and then, or, or in, in whatever confidential environment with a backdoor, and you wouldn't even get to know about it because you don't have the attestation flow going because you're unenlightened. So, right, but the, the attestation is running in the pairvisor. So the pairvisor is performing attestation to provide security guarantees. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it just sounds like you're providing confidentiality as a, as right, a service, is, right? There'll be a tick box on your web that says, this is yeah, one I, way I tested that you. you can provide confidentiality, right? If you think of confidentiality as a spectrum. But if you have unenlightened guests, don't you, you also do, right? have all shared pages and all shared memory in the guests? Like, so, so kind of getting really into details, but here pages are private by default. The pairvisor will only make pages shared as required to perform IO or do operations like that. Which is somehow magically done with pair virtualization. Yes. Okay. We, they do have a TPM here, right? So you can have an, an unenlightened guest that might not know anything about confidential attestation, but it can at least do some kind of attestation and see, oh, it's a TPM. And then, yeah, the guest itself might exactly know, but it might not know everything, but a client can know, oh, okay, cool, I'm using you know, Azure or whatever, and they, I don't work there, by the way, but I'm using Azure or whatever, and I expect them to have this TPM, 
uh, present, and I am going to think that that proves something or other about the kind of guess that I'm running. And there's some kind of guarantee there. Up to you if it's completely rigorous, but you know, an unlightened guess can can have a sense of uh, confidentiality. So I just wanted to mention that the use case for, for Paravise is not only fully unenlightened guests, but also less enlightened guests. So um, what a Paravisor saves you, for example, is to implement something like a VC or VE handler in the guest, or to make the guest to, um, have code in the guest that, that modifies the page tables to, to set a CBIT for everything encrypted, right? So Or handling interrupt virtualization, right? Like MD right, MD or handling page. interrupt virtualization, which is very important on, on, on the MD platform, for example. So. Like you can um, imagine like how invasive supporting secure interrupts is to an existing operating system. Right. Um, so I think even Windows has has, has some enlightenment, right? It it it, yes. it has even the con it, it understands the concepts of private and shared memory, and it understands the concept that it has to use shared memory for DMA because it still uses the devices by the used by the Azure hypervisor for performance reasons. So. Um, so there is still room for a pairwise even with, with some enlightenment in the guest. So. I believe there's a question over there. So, so you mentioned the attestation is, is part of the functionality the, that firma provides. The could, could you tell us more? What else does it provide? Sorry, can you restate that last part? So could you tell us more? For, like, for example, what, what else does it do for the unaligned guest? Like, does it improve security in some way, for example? Right, so you can think of the paravisor is a much smaller code base than, you know, the whole guest operating system. So, you know, especially as we really see the value in Rust and doing all this, being able to provide security to the guest by like filtering interrupts and filtering, you know, device accesses through the user mode VMM in Rust. You know, we believe we can provide more security to the guest than trying to harden the whole guest itself. So what, what, which kind of uh, security improvements you can do there and which kind you, can, can do it, you have to do in the guest? I mean, you can do anything in a guest, right? The question is how Yeah, but what do you have to do in the guest? You don't have to do anything because the paravisor could the R paravisor today does require, you know, some enlightenment in the guest around page visibility, right? But the guest is still using, you know, existing Hyper-V para virtualized storage. It's still using existing interrupt management, right? It's it's not. It doesn't have to manage like attestation or those kinds of things. So to answer your question, like about what what do you do, like in OS versus what do you do, you know, in paravisor or whatever you call it, right? Component privilege component running inside a guest. So we have, like, let's take Linux as an example of OS we'll be running. So we have done a lot of work exploring what it would take to harden Linux and what kind of invasive changes it would take, you know, to be merged and so on. So, and we also compared it to what it would take, like, you know, to do these changes in a parvisor. So, and the conclusion and, you know, the feedback from Linux community definitely was that, you know, some of these changes are so invasive that, you know, maintainers don't want these changes, at least now, while maybe there's not enough exploits visible. So that's why there is like definitely value in having a paravisor where you can pro proactively, proactively put these defenses. So if you're interested, we have talks online also about this topic. So there was one yesterday. There was one yesterday about spectral method mitigation by just simply, I mean, unsharing pages with the guest, right? Yeah, so, so it's not just speculation or docs. It, it's everything, so you can do actually. There's a lot of additional things you can put into Paravisor. So it's like you can, you can look at the whole threat model and seeing, okay, which t things you care about, what attacks you care about, what do you think is unrealistic to do on the OS side, and you know what you can actually do on the OS side. Because it, and it also depends if you're running workloads, just if you're okay running it behind a Paravisor, or you want to run the plain OS inside your confidential guests. So. It's all the trade-offs, you know, you as a CSP or tenants will have to do so. So, so we, 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 we are here for, I guess, one hour, one hour and a half, and we saw three pair of visors being, being, being demonstrated. Mm -hmm. I guess there's a common team that all of them are featuring a VTPM. Um, can you share with us if some of the other, I mean, um, uh, questions that we try to answer here 
uh, how they were answered in OpenHCL. For example, do you have a network stack? Are you extending the EK or are you der der deriving the EK from, I mean, from the underlying hardware root of trust? How, how, how are you doing that? Yeah, uh, unfortunately we're like at time, right? Oh. But I can catch up with you later. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, this is best left to probably another forum. But you know, we, there are things that the pairvisor can do and there are things the pairvisor cannot do. I think James wants to interject. I'm going to ask the question. I'm just going to point out you have a boff coming up yes. where we can actually go into more detail on this rather than derailing this session. Yes. Yeah, I mean, we're out of time, so. <laughs>